ask Brother Elam what the word of the hour is. What is it? Say it again. How about everybody join in with that? What's the word? Nevertheless. Amen. Nevertheless. And we're going to. Amen. We are healed. In fact, that's what Sister Becky was talking about leukemia. And she was like, but God. In fact, all she had to do was say that word. Nevertheless. Amen. And he is healed tonight. Give the Lord a praise for that. Amen. Amen. Just to, tonight will be the last message, unless the Lord lays it upon my heart. Uh, but uh, it's, it's just amazing. Because if there's something in the Bible one time, it's important. If it's twice, it's even more important. If it's three times in the Bible, it's of the utmost importance. But how about a hundred, over a hundred times, you will find this life-changing, destiny-altering, faith-building word. Shout it with me. Nevertheless. Nevertheless. So tonight, I want you to stand with me as we do our grand finale. So let the fireworks begin tonight. Amen. Our grand finale of this series, Nevertheless. Would you stand with me and let's talk about the nevertheless of His coming. He is coming soon. And I thank Sister Darnell for singing that for us tonight. And I'll tell you, I enjoy the other song by the pages. i tell you, I am healed. Amen. Yeah. By the blood of Jesus. There's an atmosphere here. And when you get in the waters that are troubled, you're going, you don't have to wait for somebody else. I, I'll tell you, it's all of ours tonight. By the blood of Jesus. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 64. If you're there, say amen. amen. Uh, Jesus saith unto him, thou hast said. Now he's talking to Caiaphas. This is in the crucifixion when Jesus is about to be crucified. Uh, Jesus saith unto Caiaphas, thou hast said. Nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter. Ye shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven, the nevertheless of his coming. Father, anoint your servant to preach the word tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings and the promises and the anointing and the healings and the testimonies. There is more for Westmoreland, more at Westmoreland. And God will give you the praise for it. Anoint, and may I decrease, may you increase, and we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. amen. As, you, as you're being seated, tell somebody he's coming soon. Amen. And give him another hand of praise here tonight. Amen. He's coming soon. And I do appreciate all of our singers. And I appreciate Brother Blue and Sister Hope and Brother Baker. Uh, give them a big hand. They do things behind the scenes to make us sound good. And we're so appreciative of, of all the people that work. Um, we're planning a connect lunch. We've got a few that has been coming and new people. Maybe you haven't noticed. We're going to do a connect lunch either on the 18th or the 20, uh, whatever the next Sunday is, the 25th, I think. So just uh, listen out for more details when we lock everything down. God is good all the time. Now, in our text tonight, Jesus is standing in judgment before Caiaphas. Caiaphas is demanding him that he answer the charges brought against him. And they are accusing him of uh, false testimony. They're saying that he claims to be the Messiah and he's not the Messiah. And Caiaphas asked him bluntly, are you the Messiah? Now go to back to verse 50, uh, 64. And Jesus answered unto him, thou hast said, amen. Thou hast said. Then he goes on to say, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. In other words, here's what he's saying to Caiaphas. Caiaphas, I am the Messiah. I have come this first time. I've come to be condemned and to die and to rise again. I have come, but that's not all. I'm coming again. 
And folks, I'm here to tell you tonight that it may like, seem like sin is winning. It may seem like that we as Christians are hated like never before. It may seem like the world is prevailing and Caiaphas is mocking and people are raging. But I have a word for this generation. I have a word for everyone, every demon in hell, and for everyone needing help tonight. And that is this word. It's the word nevertheless. And I'm here to tell you he came the first time. But nevertheless, he is coming again in the clouds of heaven even so come Lord Jesus somebody give him praise here tonight nevertheless he's coming in fact go to 2nd Peter 3 and verse 13 and you'll see that again G Peter uses that word there it is what is it nevertheless we according to his promise what promise the promise of his second coming we are looking for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelling dwelleth righteousness I'm telling you there's coming a rapture there's coming the Lord he is going to come and it may not be it may be sooner than you realize so the best thing to do is to get ready, get ready, get ready, and stay ready. Can you say amen tonight? The house was quiet one night. The old grandfather clock got stuck at midnight. And instead of chiming 12 times, it kept on chiming 17 more times. And somebody got up half asleep and said, get up everybody, it's later than it's ever been. Tell your neighbor tonight, it's later than it's ever been. Nevertheless, he is coming. Say amen tonight. Now, I want to answer the question tonight, how close are we to the coming of the Lord? How close are we? We are close to the coming of the Lord, number one, because of the sins of society. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. But know this, that when? In the... Last days, perilous times will come. Men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Have you ever seen a generation where children are absolutely allowed to run free course, no discipline, no, no disobedience everywhere, and parents just accept it? Well, I, I, if you had my child, you just give in. No, you got to stand up and say, this is the way. Now, I'm not a parent, but pastor, were you raised three? Am I telling the truth tonight? My mama's sitting out here, so I got to think, you know, disobedient to parents here. I think about those times I wasn't, amen. But that woman got a hold of me, hallelujah, glory to God. But let me tell you, there's going to be people unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God. That's where we are right now. Lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of God as some dead religion and denying the power from such turn away. Now go to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 13. The Bible says, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. I know it's close to the coming of the Lord because of the sins of society. They are getting more demanding, more in your face. There is no blushing anymore. A, a, a people can applaud the killing of a nine-month-old baby. In fact, the governor of Virginia said, if the baby comes out and it's not wanted, stick a knife in its neck and people applauded I'm telling you the sins of society are just about to tip the boiling point when Lucille Ball you know remember some of you remember Lucille Ball I love Lucy and she was married to uh, her husband who actually played on the show and I want you to understand that when she got pregnant with her husband they would not show her pregnancy on TV for fear of indecency. And this was a married couple. My goodness, how far have we come? We've gone from Lucille Ball not being shown her pregnancy, legitimate pregnancy, to Miley Cyrus, who gets on the Grammys and twerks. And we see 30 same-sex couples uh, kiss themselves of each other on a mock gay wedding 
And I'm here to tell you the sins of society are getting worse and worse. But not only the frequency of sin, but look at the availability of sin. Think of the internet. Think of your cell phone where you used to have to go into a back alley somewhere in a bookstore. But now you can just pull it right off of Google any minute of any day. I want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, that I know the Lord is coming because it is there is wickedness and evil and it is getting worse and worse and and worse and worse. What does this mean? It means the Lord is soon to return. A few years ago, the governor of New York said these words. He didn't say them exactly, but he basically this is what he said. He got up and he right smug and proud. He said, if you believe in the right to life, if you are anti-gay marriage... If you believe that you got to have guns, he said, then you have no place in the state of New York. In other words, he was telling those who believe in the right of life, those who believe in biblical marriage, uh, those who believe that we have a responsibility, not from the government, but from God to protect the innocent uh, and protect our families. Uh, he was saying, you just leave. Well, can I tell you something? He may just get his answer wished. Because one of these days, brother, they're going to look around and where are all those pro-life people? Where are all those people who believe in truth? Somebody came in the middle of the night and took, and they left. Hallelujah. The Lord is soon to return. And governor of New York, we're about to leave. Amen. Anybody going with me? Give him a hand of praise here tonight. Hallelujah. We're about out of here. Hallelujah. We're going to, you want it? You can have it. And I'll tell you, it'll bring the judgment and condemnation of the Lord. Amen. I could go into more of the sins of our society. But let me talk to you, number two, about the signs of the times. I know we're close to the coming of the Lord because of the signs of the times. How do we know that we're right close? Well, we're technologically ready. Did you know on a computer in one billionth of a second, you can debit 2,000 checks from 300 different bank accounts? On a computer, you can examine the EKGs of 100 patients. You can figure the payroll for a company of 1,000 employees, and that is all in one billionth of a second. I want you to know we are technologically ready. You have more computing power on your flip phone than the largest computer of the 60s. Those of you that still have a flip phone, by the way. Oh, I see, I see. Amen, amen. I know, brother, come on to Best Buy. We'll get you, get you a nice phone. Amen, hallelujah. You'll wish you'd never stay hung on it so long. Several, what, are, I mean, we're technologically ready. The internet, GPS positioning, global positioning, satellites that can, can you know, on my phone, I, when Darnell is away, I can pull up on my phone, and it will, she went to a, a women's conference down at Fayetteville, and I, I knew she was headed back. I, she texted me, she was on the way back, and some time had elapsed, and I wanted to know quite where she, how far away she was from home, and I pulled up my iPhone, <laughs> and I hit find Darnell, and I found, guess where I found her? She was at Chick-fil-A, <laughs> down in Fayetteville. Now, we laugh about that, but I'm here to tell you, brother, that's technology. And when you read the book of Revelation, how the Antichrist is going to make you have a mark, why is that? That's a computer chip. Just inside of your cell phone is a, is a little chip called the SIM card. And what they want to do is put a SIM card in all of you, uh, so that you. And they say, "Well, this is for medical records. Uh, this is for uh, health issues." No, it's not. It's to keep you people who believe the Bible to find out where you are and hunt you down because you don't believe uh, in gay marriage and things like that. They're making it a crime that if you talk against gay marriage, you will be arrested. Uh, your funds will be confiscated. It's not a matter of if it's going to happen. Uh, if the presidential election doesn't go our way, uh, and I don't mean. Our way, Trump's way, I mean God's way, whoever it is, hallelujah. I'm here to tell you we're on the verge of having to make a declaration. Well, here it is. Nevertheless, God is still on his throne, and we're going to serve the Lord. Yeah. Somebody say amen. In fact, uh, it's called the very chip. 
Uh, it's about the size of a grain of rice. Uh, it has beneficial purposes. If you have one of these very chips inside of you, your medical records can be on it. Think about all of the technology. Brother Blue, have you got that picture I want to show the folks? This is a drone that's getting ready to be shown. <laughs> but um, I was reading uh, Robert Gates, uh, who used to be the Secretary of Defense under George W. Bush and then under Obama. And he wrote, a, he wrote a, his biography, his memoirs. And as I was reading it, he, he described these drones that they were using in the military. And this is how he described it. He said, I was taken to a new hangar. This is the former Secretary of Defense of the United States, Robert Gates. You may not remember him. It's about 10 years ago. And he said, I went to see a Predator drone and a Reaper drone. He said this, quote, they both look like giant bugs. With long spindly legs and a broad wingspan and a camera pod that looks like a huge eyeball. And that's, when I read that in his memoirs, I thought about the book of Revelation. John is describing things that he didn't know how to describe. And he described creatures with wings, with eyes. And I wonder if John was seeing these drones. And brother, those drones are everywhere. People are buying them off the shelf. They're using it for many purposes. Some recreational, some property. Realtors use it. Uh, even somebody in our own church, I believe Brother Woody, uh, took a drone up and took an aerial shot of our church. But my friend, the technology is there. We are coming close to the coming of the Lord. Not only are we technologically ready, we're socially ready. What do you mean, socially ready? Think of how connected we are. Listen, back a hundred years ago, people couldn't even think about going to another continent. People couldn't think about going across the globe. But you can get an airplane from Raleigh. And you could be in another hemisphere in a matter of uh, 15 to 18 hours. We are socially ready. There's globalism. Free trade, which has ruined America. And thank God for America first. That is not anti-Christian. That is to make us a strong nation that we can send people out into the world. The wealth of the wicked is laid up for the just. I believe in strong uh, American first. Hallelujah. That's not being Republican or Democrat. That's just being smart. Amen. Free trade means uh, uh, we've got people like in Mexico and China who have no life. They have absolutely nothing. They pay them pennies a day and they live in squalor and they ship those goods to America. And then we buy them at, and then they charge a, a high tariff on it. To, and so we have to pay extra for it while the only people getting the money are the bad guys in the government. I say let us stand with our president and support America first. Yeah. Come on, Christians. Well, I don't know. It might hurt my crops. It ain't going to hurt your crops. Uh, brother and sister, we, when America was first, uh, when, we had, when we didn't have free trade, uh, brother, we built a nation uh, and we all prospered. People don't realize it, but, but uh, after the Civil War, the South was devastated. And a group of people got together and said in Charlotte, North Carolina, we're going to rebuild the wealth of the South. Uh, and the largest city in the South is Charlotte, North Carolina, and that great big building up there. And I'll tell you what, it wasn't because somebody overseas did it. Uh, it's because somebody, oh my God, I'm about to preach here tonight. Amen. We're socialists. Everybody wants globalism. Everybody wants free trade, uh, the internet. In fact, they used to say uh, it's a small, small world after all. And you know what? And the, 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 we know it's the end times because it is a small, small world after all. We're socially ready. We're the, uh, uh, te technologically ready. And we're theologically ready. Right. What do you mean? Because more and more people are trying to become ecumenical. And your religion is good. And my religion is good. And so Muslims and Christians and Jews and everybody can just smile and get along. And on the outset you would think that sounds good. Until you become to realize that. If you stand against certain things, uh, you're going to be called a heretic. We're theologically ready. People today, they don't care what religion is. They don't care what theology is. Uh, and that's just exactly what the Antichrist, he's going to come up and say, I'm God. And people going to be like, yeah, theologically, that's probably right because it feels right. It sounds right. But it isn't right. Uh, people, listen, people are, are all, it, they say, all roads lead to God. 
That don't even make sense. Let me tell you where Westmoreland Church is. It's on Tillman Road. If you live over where I live, you got to get on uh, Raleigh Road, and then you got to turn on Airport. Now, what if I got on Raleigh Road and I turned right on Airport? I'd wind up over there on Forest Hills. Uh, not Forest Hills, but uh, Tarboro Street. All roads don't lead to, to, to Westmoreland. you got to get on the right road, take the right turn at the right place. You can't get off an airplane and just go to any gate. And go to any city. You got. If you go into New York, you better go to gate 292. If you go to gate 293, you might be in China. We're not. Listen. Theologically, there is only one way. His name is Jesus. Well, I tell you what. I think that's how you think. Well, how do you prove that? I tell you how I prove it. An empty tomb. Glory to God. Jesus rose from the dead. Muhammad is still dead. Uh, Buddha is still. Y'all sitting there tonight. I'm telling you, Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and nevertheless, uh, He's coming. We're theologically ready. Everybody wants to believe in one world government, one world God. We're economically, we're economically ready. The American Bar Magazine reports that crime would be virtually eliminated if cash became obsolete. Cash is the only real motive for 90% of robberies. Hence, the liquidation would create miracles in ridding the earth's citizens of muggings and holdups. So if we do away with cash, then what do we have? We have the debit card, the credit card. And look at our society. Very little cash transpires anymore everything's on a card even three dollar drink at the store on a card why is that that shows me we're in the last days why because eventually it's going to come to where it's going to be no cash you just scan your hand and you get groceries or if you don't get that little bar there then you don't get groceries i want you to know i'm going to be out of here before that time comes though I said, nevertheless, we're politically ready. We're politically ready. We're, we're th uh, technologically ready. The technology is there. We're socially ready. Everybody's wanting one world. We're theologically ready. Everybody wants one religion. We're economically ready. Uh, people want a cashless society. And we're politically ready. Listen to this. A European statesman said, uh, said many years ago, he said, here it is, if the devil could offer a panacea for the problems of the world, I would gladly follow the devil. And this was a man in high government in Europe. And that's exactly what's going to happen. There is a man coming who is the devil incarnate. And he is going to seemingly offer answers to a hurting world. But I'm here to tell you, People are looking for politicians. Don't you get, I am so, people are all the time looking for uh, the government to bail them out. People, well, we got to, Lord have mercy. If I survive this, you know, we'll, we'll be all right. Well, what are we going to do with the college debt crisis? I got an answer for it. College debt means you took out a loan. Here's a, here's a way to solve it. Pay it back. One of my coworkers said, well, I got $75,000 in college debt. Well, I said, pay it back. Amen. That ain't right. You know, I'm trying to get an education. Was it not right for those teachers to get paid? Do you, do you think anything is free? If that's the $75,000 you, $75, you owe, then praise God. It's for benefit. Amen. You need to pay it back. Don't expect me to pay it back. Don't expect the government to pay. We've got everybody wants the government to get. They have five children. Don't have a husband. Why? Because they can. Man, I'm on fire tonight. I can tell you, Pastor. You started it. Amen. I'm sure I got five, ch five children. And you don't have five different daddies. And you're expecting us to pay the bill. My God. It's t the Lord is soon to return. People are looking to the government for everything. Thing. Amen. And don't tell me I'm not a Christian. Don't tell me I don't have compassion. If you have five children, we're going to help you. Amen. We're going to stand there. The, of all people, the church will be with you. Y'all got mighty quiet here tonight. Because God is a God of grace. But I'm here to tell you, people, people are looking for... <laughs> years ago, one of our presidents gave out cell phones. I ain't going to call what it was. 
And the other day, somebody came in to our store and said, I had a such and such phone, and now I'm here to get another phone. I'm like, well, you're going to pay for this one, brother. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's a new chief in town. Amen. And by the way, when you pay for something and you hard-earned money, you pay for it, you might take care of it instead of treat it like trash. Hallelujah. There is nothing wrong with personal responsibility. Your responsibility is your response to your ability. I'm here to tell you we're overextending and we're looking for other people to bail us out. We're looking to the government when God never intended the government. The government is to protect us as a society. It is never meant to rob us as a society. The more money in my pocket means the more money that's going to go to missionaries and souls saved. And quite frankly, I'm tired of bailing people out having five children. Come on. Well... You know, we just ought to accept people all. We ought to have open borders. We ought, to, we ought to just let people come on into America. Aren't you a Christian? Shouldn't you let everybody come in? Can I ask you a question? How many of you have a house? <clears throat> how, many people, how many people live in your house? Two or three? Well, if that's the case, why don't we let three more come in since you need an open door? Amen. These people that want open borders don't even have an open door in their house. These people don't, don't want a fence have one sky high at their house. Now, I'm, they're, not, they're, not looking for, they're not looking for compassion and to help people. They're looking for voters. Can you get it? And to take advantage of people. Like, there is a right way and there is a godly way. And there is a place in this country for people who need to come here and who want to come here. Who get in their place and say, God, by your grace, help me. And God will do it. Say amen, somebody. But I can't have 15 people in my house as much as I'd love to help 15 people. There is a limit to what I can do. Somebody say amen. amen. And if our country continues to take people and people and their, their, uh, their, um, uh, their financial burdens, uh, we're going to go bankrupt. Uh, we cannot help every human being on this world with a dollar. How can we help them? We can be strong and go to them and help them help themselves. Uh, yeah. Amen, somebody. What's wrong with us going over there and saying, hey, why don't you do it like us? Well, they're shouting death to America. Well, friend, the Lord is coming. Amen. Yeah. Facebook might post this, ban this video, by the way. Now, I'm not kidding. Amen. The One World Trade Tower. You know the two trade towers that got knocked down? They now have built, rebuilt the one, and they call it this. One world trade tower. Everybody's thinking about one world. I believe it's the Lord is about to return because of the sins of society. Because of the signs of the times. And then I'm going to try to bring this to a close because of the signal, point three, of fulfilled prophecy. There are prophecies, for example, and i got to go through this quick. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 7, you don't have to go to the scripture. But he said there were, and as, as it gets closer to the coming of the Lord, there will be more earthquakes. I'm telling you that Hal Lindsey said in 96, and this is 20 years ago. He said um, that earthquakes are happening more and more. In the decade, up until 1890, earthquakes pretty much happened um, about four. A four every year. From 1890 to 1950, about four earthquakes a year. In the decade of the 50s, there were nine recorded. The decade of the 60s, 13. In the decade of the 70s, there were, there were 51. In the decade of the 80s, there was 86. And then from 90 to 96... There have been more than 150 recorded just in that decade. The Bible says that there will be more earthquakes as we get closer to the coming of the Lord. It is proven that there are more earthquakes. In fact, I was sitting in that office in this church when I was pastoring here at Living Waters. And I was sitting in that room back there at the table. And I was reading. It was quiet. And all of a sudden I heard something kind of rattling. And I looked around, uh, and I said, what is that? I thought maybe a big truck had gone by. But it, it, didn't, it didn't just stop and move on. It, it lasted for about a minute and a half, just a little <laughs> slight ride. And if I were had the TV on, I might not have even noticed it. The only reason I noticed it because it was super quiet in there. And the next day on the radio, I heard uh, a minor earthquake had hit Richmond, 
And as far south as Wilson and, and beyond, people felt the tremors. Folks, that was the first earthquake. The second earthquake I experienced was in Mount Olive, North Carolina. Mount Olive's on the other side of Goldsboro, for those of you that need to know. I was, a Pastor, you might have been there that day. Were you there that day that R.L. Downing was, was uh, I was, Doug Bartlett was here, I was here, R.L. Downing was over here, and, and literally, Doug went up, I went down, R.L. went up, I went down, we, it was like, ooh, it's like, and I didn't know if we were having an experience with a revival, I didn't know what, I didn't know, we all looked at each other and come to find out, it was an earthquake. I'm here to tell you, folks, the Lord is fulfilling prophecy. He's telling us that he's coming. Say amen. amen. Jesus said that you'll know it's the last days because as in the days of Noah. What will happen in the days of Noah? A flood. The tsunami of 2004, the day after Christmas, 15 years ago, hit that area of the world. And they realized that the people killed from that tsunami is greater in number than the inhabitants of the world at Noah's time. So we are seeing tsunamis. We're seeing earthquakes. Jesus said there'll be wars and rumors of wars. Say amen. amen. There's wars. In history, there have been over 15,000 recorded wars. But nothing like what we saw in the 20th century. Two world wars and the dropping of the atomic bomb. And the estimate, listen, in 6,000 years of human history... 600 million people have died from wars. Of the 600 million people that have died from wars from the beginning of the time till now, of the 600 million, 300 million of them died in the 20th century. Folks, prophecy is being fulfilled. When President Bush ordered to, for Iraq to be liberated, this was the fulfilling of Revelation 17 and 18 where it says Babylon will be rebuilt. And today Iraq and those countries are becoming major players in the world. I want you to understand that Jesus, another sign of his, and I'm, I'm coming to a close here. I promise before the Lord returns, I may finish this, all right? Because Jesus said that the nation of Israel will blossom as he, at the, you want to know how close we are to the coming of the Lord? Think about the nation of Israel. God said that before my coming, I will restore the land of Israel. In fact, the Antichrist will step in the temple. And I want you to know the temple is being rebuilt as we speak. The Sanhedrin has been reconvened after 2,000 years. They have recently found the 12 stones for the high priest. They now have the elusive blue dye that is necessary for the robes of the high priest. And, and you know what? Uh, who would have ever thought when Israel had the 12 tribes, and, or the, Israel, Jacob, had 12 sons. And the Levi, his son Levi, their children were... Uh, commission with keeping the temple. Well, I thought, who in the world, if we build the temple, how are we going to figure out of those Jews who's from the tribe of Levi? You ever heard of three letters called DNA? And through DNA, they're figuring out who the Levites are now. Man, it's all coming together. Amen. They have 84 vessels of the temple ready to use. I want you to know in 1917, there were less than 25,000 Jews in Israel. In 1945, there were 500,000 Jews. Today, there's over 10 million Jews in the land of Israel. The Lord is soon to return. I want you to know that we are technologically ready. We're theologically ready. We, we are socially ready. We are politically ready. The sins of the people, uh, the signal of fulfilled prophecy, it is happening. Uh, we are about to see the eastern sky split, uh, and nevertheless, uh, the Lord is coming. Can you give him a hand of praise? I'm looking for the coming of the Lord. Years ago, I read of a man who always wanted a barometer, so he bought one, a very expensive model, um, a and minutely calibrated to tell the weather. He wanted, this was years ago, back in the 30s. He wanted to set it somewhere in his house, perhaps on his mantle. So he carefully unpacked it. He looked at it. And the needle of his barometer was pointed to the sector, section that says hurricane imminent. And he shook it and he thought something must be wrong. And it still didn't adjust. He did everything right. And sure enough, it pointed to 
hurricane coming. So he thought, I have a def defective barometer. He lived on Long Island, New York. And on his way into the city, he sat down and he wrote a nasty letter to the company for sending him a defective barometer. When he arrived back at Long Island, the barometer was gone and so was his house. It was 1938 and the great hurricane had come through. There was nothing wrong with his barometer. He just refused to believe what it was saying. And my friend, the signs of the time are everywhere. Don't refuse what he's saying. I'm telling you, he came the first time. But nevertheless, he's coming again. Somebody say, nevertheless. Nevertheless, he's coming. Give him a praise here tonight. Nevertheless. As I close this series tonight, I want you to get that word in your spirit. I want you to sing it. I want you to shout it. I want you to tell the devil. I want you to tell the doctor. I want you to tell demons. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I want you to know nevertheless at your word. Luke chapter 5, verse 5. And Simon said, Master, we've toiled all night and taken nothing. Oh, but nevertheless, at your word, I'll let down the net. Hallelujah. Oh, you don't know how lost my children are. You don't know how lost I am. Psalm 106, 7 through 8. Our fathers understood not your wonders in Egypt. They, they, they sinned and provoked him. Verse 8. But nevertheless, he saved them for, oh, I want to tell you, you're not too far gone. If you think they're on drugs, nevertheless, God can save them and pull them back. Somebody shout Amen. Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 8. Stand with me tonight or I'll preach all night. Nehemiah chapter 4 and verse 8. They came against us. They ridiculed us. But I want you to know. Look at Nehemiah chapter 8. Go to verse 9. But nevertheless what? We prayed unto God. How many of you know prayer changes things? And things can be changed by prayer. Oh go to John chapter 11. My brother has died. He is in the grave. My dream has died. It's in the grave. It stinks now. Oh, but nevertheless, roll away to stone. Jesus is here and calling him out. Nevertheless, changes everything. The dead can be raised. Death can be halted. Oh, but I'm weak. Go to John 16 and 7. I'm weak and I am without. The Lord is leaving this world. Yes, he is. But nevertheless, he said, I'm going to send the Holy Ghost. It's not just a goal. It's a gateway. Nevertheless, through the Spirit of God, we can do the impossible. Shout amen tonight. And then 2 Corinthians chapter 7, uh, oh, I want you to know we were troubled on every side. We had struggles within. We had fears without. Uh, verse 6, have you got it there, brother? Verse 6, uh, but nevertheless, God gave me comfort. Uh, has he given you comfort? Uh, don't go away here depressed. Uh, don't go away here anxious. Uh, bring your needs to the altar. Because nevertheless, uh, God's going to work. Uh, and God's going to move. Uh, and then finally, he came the first time. Nevertheless, soon and very soon, somebody shout with me, nevertheless, 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 lift your hand and say, nevertheless, give him a hand of mighty hand of praise here tonight, hallelujah, hallelujah, glory, 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 hallelujah. nevertheless, glory to God, hallelujah. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the King. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Nevertheless, the King. No more dying there. We are going to see the king. No more dying there. We are going to see the king. I said, No more dying there. We are going to see the king. 